Hey there, I'm Jackie Ferris. This week on the 302, we are at the Biggs Museum of American Art in Dover, taking a look at their awesome exhibit of Art Deco Glass, finding out how it came to be and where it went in terms of technique. Take my word for it, you're gonna take a shine to this show. The 302 is headed your way. Glass can be beautiful, but there is a history behind it. And now a new exhibit at the Biggs Museum of American Art brings that to life. I'm talking about the Art Deco Glass exhibit. And I'm joined now by the curator, Laura Favell, to talk a little bit or a lot about it. Laura, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, well, thank you for coming here. <laughs> so the Art Deco movement wasn't something that happened just out of style. It was sort of a rebellion of a previous style, is that right? It was, it's an interesting movement. It comes between world wars. Um, it's named actually after the 1925 exhibition in Paris of arts decoratifs, which is where you get the name Art Deco. But it is in some ways rebelling against the Art Nouveau mu movement that was so popular before the First World War. The things had changed radically in Europe um, as a result of the war. And people were interested in more geometric forms, uh, more industrial processes. Um, if you think in your head of like the Chrysler building, those very streamlined forms, that's kind of where glass is going as well during this moment. It's really beautiful. And when you come into the gallery, you see a lot of glass that was made um, with a team, you know, near a furnace. So, and it was all very, it wasn't as elaborate, although as it was beautiful. So talk about the transition as you come in from the initial gallery into where we are right now. Yeah, as you come into the show, the first pieces you see are these very tall, very intricate forms that are made um, by a team, as you said, glass is a team sport. And they're made one-offs in front of a furnace. There's a glass blower, there is somebody who's kind of sitting down driving um, the glass blowing, has the jacks in their hand, this tool that looks like scissors to help shape it. And they're building up careful layers of color over time. A lot of times these are decorated to look like natural forms. Um, using things like um, ground up glass, which is called frit powders. Um, so you get color variations within them as well. So it looks more like a natural landscape. And then at a certain point, you get other glass makers taking off and it just goes wild. You get new, brighter colors, you get more geometric forms. And that's kind of the gallery we're sitting in now as you can see that transition. Absolutely, you see a lot of oranges and a lot of blacks. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of Asian design in some of the, the motifs that we're seeing. It does, I, that's a very astute point. But this is a moment where Japanese prints are very popular in Europe and you see some of that influence on the glass patterns. Um, in 1922, King Tut's tomb is also discovered, so there's kind of an Egyptomania going on of people who are very excited about ancient Egyptian styles and forms, and you see some of that as well. Um, like we have a piece over um, to my right that has scarab beetles on it. Now, tell me a little bit about the, the beetles. Um, the scarab beetles, this is inspired by those ancient Egyptian motifs. Okay. So this would have been seen on tombs, this would have been reproduced on prints. Um, I think this is a French piece, but also around Europe, these were becoming popular. <laughs> Absolutely, it's really gorgeous when you look at it, you know, and you look at all the different shapes and the different techniques. So glass making, while it was still, um, I, I would say in its infancy, I mean, really started to take on new processes to, to show different shapes and colors and sheens, right? It does, and every maker is trying to innovate some new process that they can kind of call their own and claim as their style. So in this gallery, you see um, things like very deep acid etching to get mm -hmm. this high relief on the glass. Um, and you see makers starting to work with heavy metals too to try to get some colors that nobody else had seen before. So it's kind of the race to be the best. It is, and I think that competition is part of what makes the show exciting, is it's not only um, French makers, but makers around Europe represented in this show. So you can see kind of across um, different cultures what is going on in glass and how they're influencing each other. Yeah, I was going to ask that. I mean, because it seems like a lot of them are different, but there are some common 
themes in them in terms of pattern or you know the placement of the designs but if you look at you know this jug back here the purple jug with the the white can you see it back there oh, it's, yes it's really interesting and it kind of stands out from the rest of the room it does and i think that one in particular was inspired by jewelry that's meant to look like necklaces kind of draping around the vase um, but you get makers who are looking at a lot of different sources too as they're trying to figure out how to make their pieces stand out, how to make them a little more saleable too. That some of these are one-off high-end, but some are also a little more affordable so that many people could have them in their home. So were these items the kind of things that the artists would sell themselves or would they be in stores? Or are some of these um, considered, even back then, gallery pieces? I think all of the above, um, that some of these would be sold in stores, it kind of depends on the price point. Oftentimes a maker would send whatever they thought of as their best piece or best group of pieces to something like a World's Fair so that it could be shown against the best work of other glass makers and help to build a bigger name for themselves. Absolutely. Now when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about how the process of making glass, ornamental glass like this, has advanced. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Nick Serator, Exhibitions Director for the Rehoboth Art League, and I always enjoy 302. Thank you. Welcome back. We have moved further into the exhibit to a time when techniques for glassmaking and craftsmen really kind of changed. Now we're here with the curator, Laura Fravel, to talk a little bit about this. And you really can see the difference as you journey through the exhibit and you come into this room. Yes, and one thing you'll notice right away is color disappears. Yeah. Um, behind us are many works by Lalique. You might be familiar with the name from things like um, Hood Ornaments on Luxury Cars, also did large glass panels for architectural buildings, for ocean liners, um, but he really changes the game for Art Deco glass. Um, he started off before the war as a jewelry designer, mm -hmm. um, from there got into perfume bottles and then that led into glass manufacturing, but he was interested in how to take glass into the modern age. So he um, innovates new ways to stamp glass, blow it into these steel molds, um, and also through hydraulic pumps actually kind of push glass into every little nook and cranny so it becomes much more sculptural. You don't get those nice rounded forms, instead it feels like a statue, it's got this very deep relief. Mm -hmm. um, and to really show off all that detail, he takes away the color. He focuses mostly on opalescent glass that has this kind of bluish shimmer to it. Um, so you can really see all of those details that he's trying to create. And didn't he have a special recipe for the what looks like the milky glass? Um, he does, yes. And I think other glassmakers tried to imitate this and made their own recipes, but yeah. his recipe, he added arsenic to get that milky quality oh. and then cobalt so it's a little blue. So it looks a bit like an opal up close. It's supposed to kind of shimmer and have some gold flecks. Um, and one reason he does this is that then when the glass is thicker, it's almost opaque. And then when it's thinner, you can kind of see through it. So you get a sense too of, of the depth he's trying to create and it kind of pulls in the light. That really is um, interesting how, you know, it kind of metamorphoses into something completely different. And when you look at the molded glass, it really is interesting. At first you see the design but then you see the pattern, like um, what we have here, in this case here with the antelopes. Talk to me about that. Yeah, that's one of my favorite pieces in the show because from a distance, you don't notice all those details, that it just looks very geometric. Um, it looks like it's covered in bubbles, which I think is a little tongue in cheek. Um, sometimes when glass cools, it gets bubbles in it. So I think a lot of glassmakers play with this form. Um, those nice curved bubbles also catch the light well. But then when you look closely, you start to see all of the detail in the pattern on the surface, these little antelopes jumping over every single bubble. So it's a nice transitional piece between those more sure. figurative earlier works and then kind of these more geometric forms with relief. When you look at it, of course, you know, the, the design that it's pressed into reminds you of bubbles, but in the same case, there is a piece that has bubbles in the glass itself. And that's really amazing that they're able to do that. Yeah, and then when glass gets thicker, you can trap bubbles, which mm -hmm. I know that one maker in particular was looking for that kind of champagne effect of the bubbles coming up the glass. Um, and that is technically challenging too, to try to anneal something that thick, that glass has to be cooled in a very specific way or it can crack or even explode as part of that process. Oh, really? So there are glassmakers who are trying to figure out how to get glass back to kind of its most basic forms and, and push what it can do. 
So did this, did glass making as an art become safer or because there was so much experimentation, was there a little more risk involved to doing all of this? I think it's just an interesting experimentation that um, late 19th century Art Nouveau kind of set a high standard for what art glass could be with makers like um, Louis Comfort Tiffany with Emile Gallet in France. Mm -hmm. And then this generation is kind of the younger generation that decided to take that and push it in every direction possible to see what glass could do. You know, I wanted to ask you about Louis Comfort Tiffany. I know that you just had a really big exhibit um, not too long ago on some of his glass, but did he um, have any impact in this type of glass? Um, not so much. The rooms we've seen so far are mostly um, European makers, so they weren't really responding to them. He was responding to them. Um, but I think he was very influential in the U.S., that he kind of set the standard that then we'll see some works later in the show, like Stu Ben, that that generation is, is taking up and trying to make a little more utilitarian. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the designs, we mentioned the antelopes, um, but you start to see as you come through the um, exhibit, you start to see, you know, animals. And this was a trend um, because of zoos, is that right? It was in part. Uh, zoos were becoming more popular this time. The artists could sketch from animals in person instead of looking at prints. So I think you see a lot more animals. Um, and one thing that has been surprising to me with this show is we do free tours every Friday at 11.30. Okay. Um, and our tours, um, I thought that that would be mostly adults on the tour, but it tends to be a lot of children who really love the show, that they love all the animals, they love the bright colors, they love that the show itself is sparkly. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just vases or boxes, there are also figurines as well. Yes, there are some more sculptural pieces that um, are kind of like a paperweight or you could put on your desk or you can admire from afar that some of them get even taller. And it really is amazing because a lot of the, like the, the figurines, um, the clear, it looks like a, a goddess doing her thing. I mean, it really kind of gives you, it makes your mind work a little bit to put detail in it because it's so clear and beautiful. It does, and I think we have a tendency to think of glass as utilitarian, as something that I have a flower vase or mm -hmm. I drink out of this, um, but this glass is kind of at the level of art. It's like having a painting in your home, so you can also think of it as something more sculptural to admire. Well, it certainly is beautiful. And when we come back, we're gonna take you to the more modern era of glass making as an art form. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Nancy Alexander. I'm the director of the Rehoboth Beach Museum in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. And I had a blast today sharing our city's history with the 302. Welcome back. We have moved into the final room of the Art Deco exhibit at the Biggs Museum of American Art. And I'm joined by the curator, Laura Fravel. Now, Laura, I noticed that when we started, we had lots of color, beautiful designs. We move into the middle of the exhibit, color goes away. You know, the way things are made or, you know, they get a little creative. And now we're back to color that almost look like, you know, jade or gemstones or elements. Yes, and part of that is we're in the section of the show that is very international. That we're starting to look at makers from Czechoslovakia, from Sweden, from Italy, from Spain. So it's going very wide in the type of approaches to glass. And I will mention that this is the UN's International Year of Glass, so that feels like this show is appropriate for this moment. Absolutely, absolutely. And what does it mean whenever they um, call it a year of glass? Are they just celebrating the artistry or? Um, celebrating the artistry and then also encouraging projects like this that really take a close look at the history of glass um, and also projects that look at how we use glass now and things like smartphones, fiber optic cables. Um, that technologies keep changing and we keep using glass in new and different forms. Absolutely, it's, it's useful and it's beautiful at the same time. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about some of the, the Czech glass, which is really gorgeous. There's one vase that has all these gold flecks in it. Now, is it actual gold or is it glass flakes of gold or? It is actual gold. Um, but in this room, we have a case showing a lot of different methods of glass. Mm -hmm. This is a maker who used um, foils in their art. So mm -hmm. sheets of gold that were wrapped around the glass. Sometimes they're flaked ahead of time and then rolled and added more glass on top. Um, in the same case, you can see enamel on glass. You can see glass that's made to look like malachite and lapis. So it looks like a gemstone sculpture. 
um, and a few other forms that also work with that thicker glass again to try to get the bubbles in it. It really is amazing when you look at just all of the different techniques. Um, there's one vase that is layer upon layer of glass with etching from Sweden, is that right? Yes, or fours, um, and that's actually um, one of my favorite cases in the show. Oh, okay. We call that the fish tank. It's like a little aquarium showing different makers who all approached glass with these fish forms. That's an, again a little tongue in cheek because glass looks like water. But the vase you're talking about from Orifors, um, they etched fishes on the inside of the vase, put another layer of glass over that and kept building it up with kind of plants and things around the outside. So it looks like you're looking into an underwater landscape. It really is beautiful. And you think just all the effort and the technique and how it, it had to advance to get to that point. You know? Yeah, it's a lot of very talented glassmakers at the height of their art, just trying to see how far they can push things, which is exciting. Um, and I'll share with you actually that throughout grad school, I did glass blowing on the side just to relieve stress. But I walk through this show and I have no idea how some of these things were made. That to me, it's alchemy. That somebody has go. discovered something in the studio and they have made it their own. And it changes throughout the day, depending upon the light. It does, yeah. If I walk through an hour later, you'll see different pieces light up as they catch the sunlight. We do have a few cases installed in front of our windows. Mm -hmm. um, today we're here on kind of a gray day, so you see some more of those kind of foils light up. Uh, on a brighter day, some of the colored pieces will kind of release a spectrum onto the wall. Sure, sure. And when we come into this last room, um, there's a really beautiful decanter that really is, if you told someone, think of something that's Art Deco, this is the kind of object that would pop into their mind. It is, it is the height of Art Deco. It is that leaded crystal. It's got um, some cut lines in it, so it really sparkles. Very geometric, very sparse color, but that's what I think of as the height of Art Deco for this moment. It really is beautiful because there's so much going on because it's it's cut with the uh, you know the, it has the designs and everything, but just every time you look at it, you see something new, which is really gorgeous. I wanted to ask about uh, the Steuben behind us. Now, you told me that before we started rolling, she told me this was her favorite piece. Why is that your favorite piece? I love this um, just because it's so simple, but so well done. Um, it's three kind of balls of glass on top of each other with these flared um, lips on either side. And to do that all evenly, um, sitting there with hot glass, it's spinning constantly. You've got jacks, these tools like scissors, and you're just trying to make perfectly even balls. Oh. Um, but it just, it's, it's perfect, it's simple. And Stu Ben is one of those American makers who also kind of pushes the envelope here and invents new colors. Um, some pieces in this case, you'll see the bubbles appearing again, uh, taking those trends in Europe and making them their own. Now, whenever we come and we do a show on a, an exhibit, you know, typically it's, from pieces from a collection here, collection there. But this is all carefully curated by one individual. This all belongs to one person who very thoughtfully chose each piece. Tell us about that. Yes, this collection is all um, from David Hutchthausen, who himself is a glass artist. He uh, was the graduate assistant for Harvey Littleton, who's kind of um, the father of the American studio glass movement in the 1970s in grad school. David started collecting some of these glass pieces and then just never stopped, um, especially in the era of eBay that he's still tracking these down. He's trying to find these in flea markets and it has grown and he has a great eye too. And throughout his career, this collection has also influenced his own work in glass, that he started off as a student of architecture, and then while doing that, became very interested in the way light reflected around interior surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, so in the Art Deco glass, he's looking for these very geometric forms and how they reflect light internally and applying that to his own work. So what types of, of glass does he, does he create? Um, mostly these days, he's doing very sculptural things. Um, yeah. It kind of looks, um, like it's inspired by this greatest iteration of Art Deco glass, that it's these very sparse colors, it's got a lot of very clear forms. And I will mention this this collection is intended for the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington. They organized this exhibit um, and sent it to us. But we are so fortunate that we are able to see it here locally, that's for sure. So this must just really be a, a joy for you, knowing that you have, you know, dabbled in glass for stress relief, to just put this together and just kind of, you know, experience the difference, you know, the different kinds, different techniques, and just surround yourself with beauty. It is, and I will say, I think a lot of people should try playing with glass, that it is, it's kind of the consistency of taffy, it's fun, there's low entry points in this area, and anyone who comes to this show that 
you will recognize things that forms you have in your home, things that might be inspired by that. And then for people who are very into glass collecting, into the artistry, you will notice things that you haven't seen in person before. It's just really gorgeous. Well, thank you so much for sharing it with us. This show runs through when? February 20th. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay, thank you. We'll be right back. For more information on any of the exhibits at the Biggs Museum of American Art, you can visit biggsmuseum.org. That'll do it for this week's episode of The 302. We're going to leave you now with some more sparkling glass. Until next time, I'm Jackie Ferris. Tell them you saw it on The 302.